Okay, so I'm going to introduce our last session of the, of the day. It's a panel entitled Crypt Cryptocurrencies and Blockchain and Implications and Innovations for Financial Markets. Uh, it's going to be moderated by Daniel Matasuski. Dan is head of trading at Circle Internet Financial. Circle actively makes markets on nearly all major exchanges globally and provides significant scale in over-the-counter trading with large institutions, buyers and sellers of crypto assets. Dan earned a bachelor's degree in economics with minors in mathematics and scientific computation from BC. He's going to introduce the rest of the panel, but please join me in welcoming uh, our final panel to the stage. Yeah, and thanks for having me. Um, I was just saying real brief that it's, it's crazy that this is even like a panel, this is even like a thing, this is like real world sort of like talking points at this point. So we've come a long way, um, at least sort of it feels for me. So I want to introduce my other panelists. I have Al Brown to my right, who's a partner at Cooley, and then Jacob Duda on my left, who is in the Strategic Asset Allocation Division of Goldman Sachs. So um, we're going to try to keep this pretty high level as much as possible, and then we can probably dive deeper into the weeds in terms of like questions you may have, um, just because it, there's a lot to cover potentially in this, and we want to make sure that everyone's sort of getting the best from what we have to offer. So I want to start off real high level with my first question to both my panelists. Um, and I think this kind of is the really all-encompassing question most people have is, um, why are cryptographic assets an interesting asset class, and what do you think ultimately drives the value proposition behind them? Jacob, you want to start with me? I think this is probably more in your wheelhouse. Yeah, so I think you know our view is that uh, all these new technologies have tremendous amount of potential, and we are in a very nascent stage of of of, of, of the whole uh, of the whole industry that's being born, but. Uh, you know, in, in the current incarnations, we don't necessarily believe that all of these will survive in their current form. They all have their own problems. But they basically, the introduction of Bitcoin was a revolution in the computer science. They managed to solve the problem of distributed consensus. That was very, very hard to solve. In com that was a very known problem in computing. And it allowed to basically have a, have a di distributed database that everybody agrees. You, you have multiple copies. It's very resilient. You can, pro you can have transactions on it. And on top of that, one of the mechanisms the currency that was introduced as part of it allows you to, to, to do transactions and transfer value. So all of these things were, putting, were put together. It was the cryptography part, it was the internet, and then it was the consensus scheme and, and, and the proof of work mechanism that allowed all of this to come together in a, in a way that created something that didn't exist before and, and potentially will allow, to solve, will allow us to solve many problems in the future. But there are some certain limitations of the current incarnations of these technologies, and we'll, we'll get to those details later. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 would, I would agree with that. I mean, to, to my mind, it's, um, the real value is in the power of decentralization, the fact that it allows you to transact with, pound, with counterparties in a, in a sort of trustless environment. Um, I, I think that is the real power, and the, the, the token, the cryptocurrency, is really the fuel that drives these sort of trustless systems. <clears throat> Yeah, and I think Jacob hit on a good point where um, there are a lot of cryptographic assets now. And um, there's also a lot of tokens which sit on top of cryptographic assets, which um, I'll sort of cover a little bit later because that's sort of its own beast in itself. But um, in terms of the standalone blockchain assets that are out there, um, CME listed a futures product that started at the beginning of this year. Um, that was a ton of fireworks going into that. Besides that and sort of owning cryptographic assets themselves outright, what options are there as an asset allocator if I'm looking to sort of gain exposure to this industry? And what, not what would you necessarily recommend, but what are the different avenues you can mm -hmm. sort of get exposure to this? Because it's not always clear. Like, you see pricing everywhere, but it's, what does that mean? Like, where is it? Where do these things sit? Absolutely. So you can start with, with the basic owning the physical. So you can download some software on your computer, start, you know, create a wallet and m make a OTC over the counter deal with somebody to, to get some bitcoins and you put them in your wallet, which is nothing but a random number that sort of has a transaction corresponding to it on the blockchain uh, of the given currency. And then there, there are exchanges that allow you to, to do that transaction, which may, that may, they make it easier for you. So you, you, know, you send them dollars or, 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 or any other currency, and they, they, they help you walk through that process, and they will also house that wallet. And we'll talk about the risks later, of, of course. And then 
finally, we've seen a, a more ma maturing of the markets, and so th there are derivatives being available on on on, on these on these cryptocurrencies. Similarly, to, we, we see derivatives uh, on, on traditional fiat fiat currencies. So uh, there are the futures, and again, as the futures were introduced, it was seen as one of the signs of this industry being more legitimized and and more sort of Western society participants going into that space, but. On, on, on the flip side, it also allows a better price discovery mechanism so that uh, you, know, you have an opportunity to go short, which wasn't that easy before. So the, 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 the other market participants can, can express their opinion that you know, maybe the, the price was too high. So I, I, don't think, I don't believe that was the only mechanism that led to the, to, to, the, to, the, to the crash in the price, but definitely that contributed and it, it, it adds to the, to the ecosystem and enhances the price discovery mechanism. So, so that would be that would be the futures, and then now we have the ICOs, which is which which is uh, the digital equivalent of the of the IPOs, and those typically come with their own tokens. Which there's still a debate, and we can we can talk more in detail about uh, are they securities, are are they not securities? But basically, you you pay somebody to um, for a promise that they will develop something that will be potentially valuable in the future, and then how, how that's going to play out. But potentially, the, the, the thinking there is there will be a scarcity for these tokens, and there will be demand for, for whatever, whatever purpose you're going to use them for. So there will be demand for them in the future. That's why you're going to be able to, to sell them. And so that's another way of participating, which would be probably the most risky at the moment. Yes, yeah, true. No, I mean, it's definitely the riskiest com. This stuff is very volatile as it is, so the products that sort of sit on top of it are even more volatile. Um, and also, just this, for a little bit of color, as somebody who's traded the CME product pretty heavily, um, it has become one of the dominant mechanisms. It trades just as much as the big spot exchanges these days. Um, Al, kind of follow-up question with that. Um, obviously, we touched a little bit on the ICO side of it. Um, your firm's been really sort of at the forefront of this stuff, especially like sort of in the SAFT-based um, model. And SAFT is a simple agreement for future tokens, which looks a lot like what a safe agreement looks like in equity financing. Um, do you think that ICOs are sort of, they're gonna be here as like a way for people to get exposure to this industry? Do you think this is gonna be a future way for a lot of financing to take place? Or is this more just a niche thing that only sort of makes sense for certain, like certain tranches of financing that happen to have like a value prop tied to like a utility token? Um, it, it's really hard to know where things are going to go. I can tell you that the volume and the activity in the first quarter is up over 2017, and 2017 was a record year, so people are still raising billions of dollars via some form of purchase agreement to sell tokens. Um, a lot of the activity is outside the U.S., and there are outside the U.S. regimes that have um, regulatory schemes that are much more certain um, and define something called a utility token um, that's designed to have a consumptive use. I think a lot of the activity we see is, I mean, particularly with new issues of tokens or new issues of projects, um, are, they are outside the U.S. Um, that said, because the exchanges are so uh, robust, um, there's opportunity for U.S. investors to participate, where it gets hard is, um, you know, should these things be limited to accredited investors? To, to the extent um, trading in this asset class is limited to accredited investors, that really limits the utility of the asset because in many cases it's about broad adoption and network effects and really getting to the point where frankly, a lot of people can use them and, and, and hold them for whatever the purpose is, if it's distributed storage or, or whatever the application is, or you know, payment. Gotcha. Um, so a little color sort of, like this This seems a lot more structured, and it is, um, and like sort of where we are in, like in SAFs, and how things sort of look a little bit more like traditional financing. There was a period where the ICO sort of boom started where they would just put an address on a website, and they would like say go and everyone would just send money at it. And they were raising $50, $100 million in a clip. So like, that was, I think, what people were like, all right, something's here, and it's like sort of started to evolve. But um, there's clearly a lot of, not to say retail, but there is smaller player non-accredited money that's like looking to get access to these things. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, so. that's how the SAF came about, really. Um, you know, this, this, this um, industry of selling digital assets goes back to 2013, 2014, MasterCoin being the one that's the, sort of known as the first, but Ethereum was sort of right after that in 2014. Um, and from 2014 to 2017, you had 
promoters raise billions of dollars based on the sale of tokens, and in many ways, by exactly as you said, putting up a website address and issuing, in many cases, Ethereum-based ERC-20 tokens that were easy to generate and in some cases had no functional utility. I think when, when, when we started to talk to companies about this, particularly the companies that wanted to do this in as compliant and as above board way as possible, um, we felt that <clears throat> digital assets are different than shares of stock. Um, and there's an argument that if you have a digital asset that has a consumptive use on a network, it really shouldn't be subject to securities laws regulation. Um, and that was the premise on which many of these tokens traded for a long period of time. But I guess from, from our perspective as we counseled clients about it, you know, it's safer, particularly in the early stages before you get to a point where you have a robust network that's working to treat the issuance as if it were a security. And that's sort of where we came to the SAFT and the idea that really the only people that should participate, particularly in the early stages of the project, would be accredited investors. Um, I think when the SEC, and the SEC was largely silent in this space until uh, July of 2017, um, and then they, they came out and suggested that certain types of tokens really should be treated as a security. The, the enforcement action is, is the DAO enforcement action, and there were a bunch of things about the DAO that were unique. Um, first and foremost, the token itself had characteristics that looked like a lot like a share of stock. It gave people the right to vote. You got cash flows based on a return of investment. So it looked, the characteristics of that token looked a lot more like a share of stock than some of the other consumptive use tokens. Um, so the industry sort of digested that and said, well, we, you know, we better be careful, particularly for those tokens that have securities like characteristics. But then I think in the fall of 2017, as you got into Christmas time, and particularly after that, you know, now infamous Thanksgiving where everybody went out and bought Bitcoin, um, the SEC really took a more aggressive tack and said, we think almost all these altcoins or digital tokens are, um, are securities. And in fact, in the context of, of Bitcoin suggested for a time that it might be a security. They have recently sort of backed off that notion relative to Bitcoin at least, but there's still a pretty healthy debate as to whether Ripple should be a security or Ether should be a security. Um, and so the industry is sort of struggling with at what point do you have a token that is something other than a security? And the advice from most lawyers in the US right now is, no point. I mean, you sh if you're going to be conservative about this, you should treat that token as a security. The, the issue with that is um, if you treat it as a security, if it's held by more than 2,000 people, you need to report as a public company. You need to do SOX contr internal controls compliance. You need to file AKs, 10Qs. And there's not one issuer right now of tokens that does that based on a tokens that are being held, notwithstanding the fact that there are 1,500 coins that trade or listed on coin market cap that trade thousands of, I mean, you tell me what the daily volume is on some of these altcoins, but it's thousands of trades a, you know, a day. So um, it really is a difficult regulatory environment right now in the US. Um, I think most of the market participants are, are hoping for a little more clarity. Um, but it's, I mean, based on the current trajectory, I think unlikely other than, I think we'll continue to hear that every, every token in the U.S. that's issued by a promoter of a distributed ledger network is, is a security. Yeah, um, that's, I mean, that's the big overhang in the market right now. I mean, you've seen since, if, or if you've looked, at least since the end of the year, there's been pretty much a kind of gradual decline in a lot of the asset base, um, particularly like in ETH, which is where a lot of these tokens sit on top. And yeah, the regulatory clarity is like a big concern on that. Um, I guess piggyback on like this, this stuff is volatile, right? Like it does go down. Like what are the other big risks you guys see out there, especially on the market side? Yeah, I think the volatility, uh, going back to the cryptocurrencies themselves, if you look at the volatility of Bitcoin, for example, it's something like 100% annualized. To put it into context, some of the most volatile emerging market currencies have 20% annualized volatility and lower. So the volatility is, is, is absolutely mind-boggling. So th there's no clear price discovery mechanism. It's very hard to say what the fundamentals are. The other interesting thing is if you look at the, the whole spectrum of the currencies, uh, the larger ones, they seem to have traded on their own. But more recently, I think everything started moving together. So it, it looks like 
each of them doesn't have their own fundamentals. It's more treated as, as, as one complex, at least in the, in the last few months, I would say, like half a, half a year since, since we have seen the bubble, bubble that happened and at the end of the last year deflate in, in Bitcoin. Yeah, something that's worth noting is um, besides like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, some of the bigger ones, um, most of these other 1500 that Al sort of meant, like the base currency they trade against is Bitcoin. So that's sort of baked into the mechanics of like the pricing on this stuff at any given point. Um, that's something I think people don't always like realize is that these things don't really like, they sort of only exist in code, like they only exist against like other cryptographic assets, which can make it complicated. Um, something else I wanted to ask you, Al, is um, a lot of the exchanges, particularly Coinbase, they just bought a BD. Um, they've been talking about potentially buying an ATS. Do you think that that's the model of the future for the exchanges currently, or is that not even necessary enough clarity considering the SEC hasn't said this will give you the ability to do this? Yeah, I mean, I think the SEC continues to struggle with um, the circumstances under which they feel comfortable with retail investors in this asset class. Um, and that manifests itself in, in a bunch of ways. A as it relates to the exchanges, um, I think there continues to be a concern. So in order to trade securities or act as an exchange in, in securities in the United States, there's a, there are a bunch of regulations that apply. The, the, the first is if you're buying and selling uh, securities on the behalf of others, you're, you need to register as a broker dealer. That's a federal regi uh, registration requirement and a state registration requirement. So many of the sort of dark pools or Dan can speak to this much better than I can, but many of the trading systems that cater to really institutional investors and, and high frequency traders tend to be registered broker dealers or alternative trading systems. And alternative trading systems are <clears throat> basically like an exchange, but they're not an exchange. They're um, not registered as an exchange under the federal securities laws. And there is this concept of registered exchanges. There are very few. When you think of registered exchanges, you think NASDAQ, um, you think New York Stock Exchange. But the alternative exchanges or these alternative platforms that are really sort of sprung up from not trading crypto assets or any kind of digital assets, but were largely for institutional traders that trade big blocks of stock. Um, so. The, the, the idea with those systems and the idea of those systems from a regulatory perspective is there's, there's um, requirements that those systems have, have um, technical requirements around how quickly they can trade, settlement, custody, a, a number of specific technical requirements under the, um, it's called Regulation SCI, that ATSs need to comply with in order to show basically that um, they're maintaining assets for the benefit of their customers and they're not stealing them. And it's really hard for those rules to apply to digital assets for a variety of reasons, including, as you say, they live in the code. So um, one of the things and the biggest thing that I think regulators are struggling with in the US right now is how do you get comfortable around the valuation of these assets particularly given that there's very little disclosure around them. And then how do you get comfortable that the exchanges or a third party who's custodying these assets on behalf of a retail investor, how do you get comfortable that they can do it in a way that's very effective, particularly when you read about all these hacks and you know, thefts of digital assets in the press? And I, I just don't think they have an answer. And until they do, I don't think you're going to see robust retail exchanges in this asset class. Maybe I'll add to that a little bit. There's a huge operational risk in the area, just to take it to the to the next level. So there's the underlying protocol, let's say for the block for the for the Bitcoin and the blockchain. There's that technology that was developed by you know by many people and tested over and over. So that's sound and solid. But uh, then you have all these applications. Every exchange is an application that's written on the top of it, and. You know, there's a lot of room for error to make a coding error, etc., to leave a backdoor. Security is, is very hard in, in, in the informational domain to, to, to get the security, right? So it's, it's good for the protocol because a lot of people thought about it for a long time and we have public cryptography, we have these amazing tools, but still the implementation is hard and, and it's very easy to get it wrong. And as a result, all the large, or almost all the large exchanges until 2015 in, in the Bitcoin space got, got hacked. One third of the, all the exchanges got hacked in, in the history. And the, the, the problem, I think, is the underlying um, 
denominator is, all of these are sort of bearer instruments. So your wallet is, a, is, is some public key, which is your address where people can pay you. And then there's the private key that allows you to, to use the money or send it to somebody. The moment somebody gets hold of your private key, they can pay, pay, pay the money to themselves. And th there's a history of all the transactions, let's say, on the Bitcoin, Bitcoin blockchain. But uh, there are ways to sort of, it's a pseudonymous uh, protocol. So, uh, the, the money is linked to some address. There are certain protocols that, that are called tumblers that allow people to sort of anonymize, anonymize the, the bitcoins. You could, you could potentially pay it out to another currency, which is completely anonymous, fungible, like uh, Zcash or Monero, where, and then pay it back. And, and that way, you completely erase the trail. So the, 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 that creates a huge amount of risk, because once, once the money is stolen, even if somebody will even there's an authority that will try to investigate that makes it very, very hard to recover, recover the, the st stolen money. On the top of that, it creates new opportunities for the criminals. We've, we've all read about ransomware. So basically, the hackers hack into your computer and they encrypt your hard drive. And then they, they demand a payment to a certain address to, to, to give you the password to decrypt your data. So it creates all of those, all of those opportunities. So like, like the internet, all, the blockchain has made the world bigger, and, and, but also smaller. So it, it brings everybody together. Everybody has, has, has clo access to the network. So there's a huge network effect. But on the other hand, all the hackers that sit in all, all places around the world now are after your bitcoins. And once you become a big exchange, you are big, you're becoming much more, uh, much more of a target. And we have, we have seen that happening. So there's a lot of demand in the market for sort of custody operations that, that a lot of our clients are asking whether, you know, for example, Goldman would get into that space because we could sort of lend the credibility and we could potentially get the, the, the operations right. So the, there, there are ways to solve that problem. For example, you know, you've heard about cold storage where you take your private key and, and you basically take it somewhere where it's dis completely disconnected from the internet. There are the companies that have bought a bunker in Switzerland and they print the, the private key on, on a piece of metal and then, then store it in, in, in a bunker deep underground. But again, with that come operational risk because if you, have, you better trust your employees because if that employee learns the private, remembers the private key, the moment they leave, they can they can take you know they can make the payment to themselves. So that requires new protocols in terms of handling handling the, the the situation. You'll have to have multiple people. Some some people deal with it by splitting the key, mailing it to different addresses, etc. So that that requires very creative solutions, and uh, and 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 inherently uh, contains a lot of operational risk. Yeah, custody is a big issue. Um, I, so Circle, among some other things, we do custody crypto on behalf of individuals, and we have billions of dollars worth of crypto sitting around. Um, we don't want to be in that business. I don't think any exchange really does. I don't think people are looking for the traditional sort of custodians to step in and do this, but everybody's obviously petrified for good reason. Um, so we're not seeing a ton of follow through on that. And I think that has been a big hurdle for regulars to get around. Um, something that you sort of like touched on, though, that I'd love to ask you all about is um, specifically on like the fact that Bitcoin exchanges probably what, have like a half-life of a year, like historically. And the ones now are more better capitalized, the security's better. We haven't had like a catastrophic one go down in a while. Um, but there's a lot of the float that's stolen at any mm -hmm. given time, mm -hmm. which is a problem for the asset class as a whole. And most recently, OFAC started listing actually addresses that were banned. Do you think that's a threat to the fungibility of Bitcoin? And like, what does that necessarily mean for the asset class? Like, what does that mean for sort of investors in this? Like if you buy a hot Bitcoin, is that going to be a problem? I mean, I think the, you know, when we talked about this earlier, one of the biggest regulatory challenges for Bitcoin and the asset class generally is, you know, how, how do we view the role of, of government in, in society at a very high level? And um, it really comes down to how much how intrusive should government be on private transactions? Um, over several years, and all for good reason, um, you know, in the US we have the Patriot Act, and, and a lot of what we've done to fight terrorism is, has been at the expense of privacy and anonymity, and has grafted a central authority into a lot of our interactions that some people would argue with. I mean, if you if you go to the <laughs> if you go to the the Coinbase in Bitcoin, right? It's about the the second bailout of banks, right? And so, how government should be 
a, a player in this space. And, and if and to the extent that we acknowledge that government has to take a part in all take part in all these transactions and you have to do KYC and AML on all on every transaction, you really do lose a lot of the benefit of decentralization. Um, and, and trustless transactions without an intermediary. So it's really just a matter of, you know, how, where should government intervene and how can they do it in a way that doesn't um, destroy the value associated with decentralization and dis disintermediation of central authorities, which is what this is all about, <laughs> at a very high level. No, it is. Um, so Al made a reference to something that some of you may not know, but I think it's really interesting to know is, um, when he said the messages in like the code, like when Satoshi created Bitcoin, like the figure that nobody knows, yada yada, the he ripped the headline from I think it was a UK newspaper at the time that said I think it's like UK Chancellor on the brink of second bailout, and he just put that message cryptographically inside like the first blocks and like kicked it off. So it was very much in the ethos of like what Bitcoin was trying to be. Um, obviously, we don't know who Satoshi is now or like sort of what he would think about what the current incarnation was, but there's very clearly a message in the beginning that he was. Um, trying to bring at something on the fungibility side and sort of, I guess, on like privacy and the ability to sort of interact as private individuals. Um, something that is good is that um, New York DFS, which created the bit license and oversees all cryptographic related stuff going on in New York, um, recently allowed Gemini to list Zcash. And this was very interesting because this is the first time an anonymous based currency, which in its ultimate form would never be able to be trackable was actually allowed to be sort of traded. Like citizens were allowed to openly purchase this and transact in it. Do you think that's a step in the direction of how you think New York for DFS will go forward? I mean, it's hard to know sort of how this feels, but this seems to be a turn of fate for crypto mm -hmm. in a good direction. Uh, I, will, I will answer it, I think, uh, in, in, in a circumstance <laughs> way. But uh, basically, I think currently those anonymous currencies are not big enough yet. So they're not really a big problem. So I think the focus of the government and all of those institutions is really on Bitcoin and, and Ether. Once that completely anonymous blockchain will become big enough, then I think the governments and DEA and all of those institutions will take a long, hard look at what, what that enables. and. I leave it as a question, but uh, why do you need a completely anonymous transaction that's untraceable if you're doing legitimate business? <laughs> Fair. No, no. They, I mean, that that tends to be the argument that we've heard from regulators on that. That's not like completely sort of from left field. Um, no, that that makes a lot of sense, and I. It's tough, right? Because there's a lot of people who say that privacy is just an inherent human right, and it's the the counter argument is, well, why don't I have the ability to do it? But I get. I mean, it, it's there. it's who has access to the information and how they use it, right? And so it, it's one thing to say, you know, perhaps the federal government should have access to information so they can ensure there's no money laundering going on. It's another to say. Facebook should have access to every transaction that you make or that Amazon should be able to see everything you do or um, a big bank should be able to audit every transaction you have and where it goes. Because, you know, it's a matter of how much do you trust Bank of America, right? And so that's the, the question we need to answer as a society. And I'm not saying there's a right answer or a wrong answer, but it's not as simple as, hey, you know, everybody should be able to audit everything you do in the world. Because I, I just think that overstates it. <clears throat> And I think that debate is not only in cryptocurrencies, but more widely, for example, in, in the handheld devices. There was a discussion between FBI and, and Apple in the past about right. <clears throat> should there be strong cryptography as part of the consumer devices or not? And it, it's, a, it's a debate we have to have as a society and decide, because FBI and, and all the law enforcement are arguing that historically we have never had that privacy. It's, it's a social contract that they could always read the letters, they could always get the subpoenas to, to listen to the conversations, et cetera. Now that the public key cryptography came about, everybody can very easily encrypt, and, and that, but that's the good guys and also the bad guys. So the question is, in what situations would we want to allow governments to actually decrypt? But the, the problem technologically is it's very hard to build a backdoor because once you have a backdoor into any, any system, not only the good guys will discover it, but the bad guys as well. So it, it's a very complex problem, but it, it, it's but at the heart the of this discussion. That's the power of crypto. I mean, we're with cryptography and some of the algorithms that have been solved. Yep. We're allowed to define these things in a much more granular way than we've ever been able to find them. And so we should decide yep. <laughs> how we want them to work. 
Yeah, and there's no chance that crypto in general doesn't get wrapped up into that larger fight that's currently going on around like messaging. That's very much on the horizon. Um, all right, so to take a little side detour from like sort of the regulatory and like privacy stuff, um, one of the big criticisms of Bitcoin in particular, but most of the like larger blockchain assets, is that proof of work, what ultimately secures the blockchain, is in terribly wasteful. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is an Achilles heel to crypto? Do you think proof of stake is the solution? Or can you not actually have that level of security sort of without that level of loss? Um, I don't think that's like a solved question at all, but love to get your opinions on it. I think, uh, you know, I think Bitcoin was the first generation, it was the first cryptocurrency that came about. It solved a lot of the problems, but I think we uh, don't see it in the current incarnation as, as, you know, uh, as succeeding. I think it will have to transform itself. And the energy dependency is, is one thing. At the moment, we're looking at sort of reducing energy dependency and you know, socially responsible investing, et cetera, that includes reducing the energy, at least globally. There's a global warming debate. Uh, so I, th I think that's eventually it's a, it's a problem and it's, it's, be it's becoming bigger and bigger as the hash rate is going up and we are, we are actually burning more and more electricity. I think the hash rate has doubled over the last uh, year or so. so. So we are actually using more and more energy. The counter argument to that is, well, even if you have, let's say, dollars, you have the Fed where you have to, you know, you have the Fed and then you have all these physical dollars that you have to transfer back and forth between banks. You have to have the bank security. It, it costs you some energy as well. It's very hard to. So it's just the price we pay to have this protocol. But then the question is, does this protocol, does it justify, does it justify this protocol, which sort of started with a lot of expectations, but uh, I think in, the, in its current form, it really is a store of value only. It cannot really function as a, as a unit of, a unit of, of, of measure as a, as a currency, because it's very deflationary by, by the sort of limited, by, by the fixed supply. And, uh, and uh, it, it's not a good payment system at the moment because the, tra you know, the transactions are relatively expensive and, uh, and the, the capacity is very, very limited. The capacity of the Bitcoin blockchain is only about seven, seven per second or, or something like that compared to thousands of, of the payment companies, et cetera. So I think in, in its current form, something will have to give. Either we go to, and th there are solutions to that problem. Either we build something around it and, and we, we somehow figure out a way to make it less energy uh, demanding or in ether, what they're trying to do is try to go to proof of stake instead, where you still have some amount of mining, but uh, who mines is determined by by by, by the size of your uh, of your uh, of the amount of ether, ether you own. Again, the counter argument is that's not democratic because basically the big players kind of get to call the shots. So so that has its own problems. But I think I think that's becoming increasingly a bigger bigger issue in, in, in for for Bitcoin especially. Yeah, I mean, I think the amount of uh, power and compute power and energy that's being spent on proving these hack hashing algorithms right now is just way too high. I think it's it's a it's a real problem and something that needs to be factored in. That that said, I, I agree with your general comment, which is if people find value in this technology, I mean, it can be forked, it can be changed in ways that allow it to become more efficient. And I think if if it gets that level of adoption and it's already sort of getting there, we'll, we'll find ways to, to make it more energy efficient. Um, so, but, but, but right now, it's, it, <laughs> we're spending, I think, way too much power on, on that process. Yeah, no, there is an incomprehensible amount of energy <laughs> being used. Um, and the, the reality is um, because of the massive power consumption of it, you end up with sort of centralized areas where this mining occurs, right? You go to where there's cheap hydro, which is in the Pacific Northwest in Canada. Um, you go in a lot of the western parts of China, um, which has actually led to a lot of local regulatory things that have been fighting it. But my question along those lines is, do you think that there is too much centralization sort of in Bitcoin for now, because like they're all sort of in the same bucket, but like proof of work based currencies is the idea of de having decentralization and it's sort of lost given the scale that the mining operations operate now. I mean, that's the core tenant of what Bitcoin is supposed to be, but does it even have it? Yeah, I mean, I think the concentration in the mining pools, particularly in Bitcoin, is, is also another concern for um, the technology long term. Um, I, I think. The reality is, though, given the length of the chain and everything else, it's really hard to do any kind of material 51% attack that does anything with respect to the historical transactions, and that's just a credit to the way the technology works. Um, I think the, the most difficult thing about it, from my perspective, is, is the fact that it's, it's really not disclosed. Like, no one really knows how concentrated these mining pools are, and I think 
Um, it would be better, in my mind, if there was a little more transparency around just who controls these mining pools and how they're being used, because I, I, I do feel like that is a little bit of a secret now, and, and people don't really understand how much concentration of power there is um, in these mining pools right now. And that's true of other currencies as well, but Bitcoin's probably the most, most notable. Yeah, so, so a mining pool is people get together and they all decide to work together to solve a block because the block is basically randomly selected every 10 minutes and then they'll divvy that up. So the idea is that if you were mining just by yourself, it might be a really long time that you get a block or it's probability that you may not even give a, get one at all, so there's no point. But if you join a pool, then you sort of get an even stream of payout and this is how a lot of miners operate. The issue is... Nobody knows what makes up these pools, right? So if the top five pools control 80% of the network, it could be one guy that's 80% of all the pools, right? And he's just spread it out so nobody knows what he's doing. So this is the, the big looming concern. And this, is, this has been an issue with Bitcoin basically since a guy named Slush created the first pool way back in the day. And there is unclear if they are going to ever get that level of transparency in it. I mean, you have large corporates now who do mining, but it's still a big concern looming at any given point. Does this change the investor outlook at all? Is this something that even comes up in the conversation when people um, are thinking about this? I think that's a, one of those more technical aspects, but uh, I think it comes in waves, right? It's, it's always somebody, it gets over-concentrated and sort of they, it's almost self-regulatory. They, they, at least they're trying to reduce the, the concentration, then, then it comes up again. I think Bitcoin itself has, you know, the, the argument I've heard from the, from, from, from the, the community is that it has mechanisms to cope with it because basically eventually when somebody will start doing something, some 51% type of attack, you will eventually get a fork because yeah. people at some point to make it worthwhile, they'll have to actually steal, you know, steal some money or, 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 or make, take it, make it to their advantage. Otherwise, if it keeps operating the way it should, then, then I don't think it would be a concern. So it really is about the impact, right? The moment that something, something is going to happen. And the, the argument is that basically then the value will adjust down and, and, and things will reshuffle. It's an economic argument argument, but I think it's a little bit of hand-waving, to be honest. Uh, I think basically the price would come down and potentially you would have a fork. So the fork is you basically you split the currency into two, two chains, like that's something we witnessed last summer when there was some disagreement about the future of the Bitcoin. So now we have Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash that have slightly different properties. The miners get to choose which one, which one they, they work on. And uh, we have seen that in, in other currencies, early in Ether, there was a huge amount of money was stolen. So basically they decided to, ex to save the the project Dow, to, yeah. to, 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 yeah, to make Ethereum right. classic, yeah. Which, which That's cost, why which Ethereum cost them and, yeah. a certain amount of credibility <laughs> in, in, in the eyes of the market, but at least that was a way to completely avoid uh, disaster early on. Right? So, to, so to bring this whole thing sort of home, so like we talked about multiple aspects of this, and I think the Ethereum fork is very interesting. So the DAO event, which Al had referenced to, that the SEC basically says that this was a security that DAO project ended up, I think it was like 10% of all the ETH outstanding. It was, it was a non-trivial amount of like the asset base. Ended up joining this ICO and the thing got hacked. So the code was actually written terribly. The smart contract ended up getting emptied. So the Ethereum community comes in and decides, well, like that just didn't happen. We can decide to like remove that from history. And a large, not a large portion, but a non-trivial portion of the community was like, no, like this is code is law. This is like what happened. Like we just like move on. And that split Ethereum into Ethereum Classic and Ethereum Now. So you just have two Ethereums this day. Um, like, I mean, there's a clear designation of which one is ETH and which one is ETH Classic. But I mean, in reality, they're both ETH, right? Like it's not like one suddenly is or isn't, right? That's just how the market has decided to go for it. So anyway, this is the kind of stuff that we have to deal with in this world, but um, forks in particular are terrible because they make it really difficult on the custody side because if you're custodying one Bitcoin for somebody and there's a fork, now you're suddenly custodying Bitcoin A and Bitcoin B for somebody. And this is like, you have to split it, you have to expose all of your like private keys. Um, it's another level of complexity that I think people don't want to deal in. And as we talked about a taxable event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, I, yeah, so you owe tax on something that you may or may not have even known happened, um, which was an issue for last year with the Bitcoin cash Dash, thing. But yeah. yeah, I mean, there's been a handful of forks. They kind of became like a thing then, like people were just like doing forks for a while. So um, anyway, we got a minute left, but I think it'd be good to do QA because I'm sure there's gotta be some questions. We touched a lot of different things on that. Uh, so just a quick update. As of this morning, Coinbase did actually acquire a ATS and registered investment advisor. So pending approval, I think it's safe to say they might be able to operate 
with uh, blockchain-based securities under the oversight of the SEC and FINRA. That said, it seems like a lot of the regulatory work is being done by these smaller startup companies. Um, there's a representative from Goldman there, Circle. I know you guys you know, have great backing. Um, as much as you guys are working on advising your clients, what influence do you guys have on the regulators to help folks understand everything you just said? Because I know folks in this room are already <laughs> confused. And if anyone watched like the Zuckerberg trial, those questions being asked, if that's too much for our legislators, I can imagine this conversation is equally daunting. Yeah, um, I'll take that one as the lawyer, although these guys may be a little bit closer to it. Um, it's a real challenge. I, I think um, one of the issues with the way the SEC has approached this is that it, it, most of the discussions that are being had right now are with their enforcement division and not their division of corporation finance, and in many cases, not even the division of trading and markets, which is the right one that would handle, in most cases, the exchanges. Um, and I think... That's unfortunate um, because the, the people in those areas, while uh, very well-intentioned, come at the world from more of a, well, a, a less tech-heavy focus. And, and so I, I think it is really difficult to um, educate. And part of what we do, well, most of what we do when we interact with regulators, whether it's the SEC, the CFTC, Congress is, it's an educational process. Um, and, you know, some of it's just not that intuitive um, unless you really take the time to download some code or, a, you know, decentralized exchange and see how it works and try to trade some tokens on Poloniex and um, Circle. Um, so um, it's, it's, um, it, it's, a real, it's a real challenge. I, I, I think when we talk to a lot of people in this space, we'd love to see um, a, a different, maybe a different organization, a different regulatory organization more involved with maybe more of a bent toward hiring people with, with technology backgrounds. Maybe, you know, just as in the context of the securities industry, it's, it's very common to hire former brokers or, you know, people actually that were at the banks. Um, you know, it may make sense in, in the SEC's context or just generally to see if, you know, we can get more of a path from the technology areas into, into the uh, regulatory organizations, because I, I do think it's a real challenge right now. Yeah, and, and to touch on it's, it's a challenge in the sense that because this stuff doesn't clearly fall into one wheelhouse, it falls into all the wheelhouses, right? So, like, there was a point in time where the SEC, FinCEN, CFTC and all the state level money transmission like groups were all saying that Bitcoin was like sort of theirs to police. And the issue is it's not possible, right? Like you can't have, you can't, we'll never be able to deal with all these regulators, especially ones that may or may not have like differing levels of opinion or knowledge even on the thing. And you're seeing this issue now sort of, Bitcoin got through it, CFTC clearly got it, but all, everything else is still going through this issue right now. And it's much more confusing because the asset base exploded and you don't suddenly have like, not that there weren't other currencies around there, but Bitcoin was kind of like the only game in town. But now you've got five or ten that are have hundred million to billion dollar valuations out there and like real money sort of floating around it. It's I don't know. It'd be great if there were one sort of federal group that really had the control of it. But at this point, it's the worst of all worlds, and we're sitting in this unknown period. It's it's a tough conversation. Also, just having the BD and the ATS it doesn't really help for the stuff that's already happened, right? Because those are technically then all illegal security offerings that happened, even though you may be saying they're securities now. So you don't suddenly just get to offer them as products on the exchange to trade. So like, what do you do with all the stuff that you got to grandfather in? Like, there's no discussion of that right now that I know of. And you just named the US regulators, and there's a lot there. But this is an international phenomenon. I mean, it, it just is. And um, so you're dealing not only with the US regulators, but regulators in China, regula regulators in Switzerland, regulators in Malta, Cayman, I mean, any number of jurisdictions. And in a lot of ways, because of the technology and what it enables, there is a little bit of a lowest common denominator approach of, on this thing. And, and I think the, the people that want to promote these projects end up moving toward the jurisdictions that are most friendly, maybe not the most knowledgeable. And, that, and that's a problem, you know? It'd probably be better if they were to go to the ones that are the most knowledgeable and there was a framework that made sense for this asset class. 
And I would add there's a huge dispersion in, in terms of how the reg different regulators treat, <laughs> treat Bitcoin. So it's, it's an asset in Switzerland. It's a financial instrument in Russia, but not an asset. It's, it's banned in China currently for all practical purposes. All the ICOs were banned in China. So, you know, there's some common denominator comes with the properties, but then the, the treatment across the world it, it varies very, very, very widely. And you know what the kicker to all this is? Nothing makes you appreciate Bitcoin more than having to deal with all this. Like, that's like the God's honest truth is like you start seeing how actually awesome it is to be able to just sort of move like value as you want and not sort of have to answer, even though like you really do, right? Like, I mean, you're still subject to it. But like the fact that you have this whole world of regulators all saying different things about it and you're like, well, I can still transact if I want. There's nothing to stop it. Hi, McGuire Del Porto, uh, BC MBA 09. Um, there was a lot of talk in 2015-ish about blockchain and the implications of uh, verification of securities transaction and eliminating kind of the clearing of <laughs> T plus one, T plus three days. Um, what, you know, what happened to that? Why haven't we seen T plus 10 minutes, T plus five seconds? Yeah, it's a great question. You're probably familiar with, with Overstock and the, the most widely known exchange is called T0, right? So yeah, th that was the goal, hit, hit T0. Um, I, I think um, there's probably a lot of reasons. I think one cynical argument would be the establishment didn't really want people to change the way settlement works. Um, but I, I think there are legitimate issues around storage and custody and technical issues around this asset class that people feel uncomfortable having large amounts of money, well, subject to um, the potential issues around hacks and again, you know, not to bring up custody again, but I, I think all those issues have made it um, have really slowed adoption. And then, of course, there's a regulatory issue. Um, we, uh, I'm a lawyer, so we, um, you know, one of the earlier applications was supposed to be in Delaware. Um, we, Delaware adopted a sort of blockchain amendments to the Delaware code that would allow companies to issue their certificates on a distributed ledger, which really holds great promise, because if you know anything about the way proxy contests work now or tender offers work now, it's, it's complete mess. Um, it's really hard to track who the owner of the shares is and, is and who gets to vote. And so the promise was if you put that on a distributed ledger, it would be verifiable in ways that was very valuable. And, and again, that's another area where it just, it's been really hard to get adoption. Part of it is the technology isn't actually that easy to build um, if you're talking about an application on, on um, either an existing blockchain or a new blockchain. You need to set up nodes. And then a lot of this is about network effects and building adoption. And it's really hard to build adoption across a large group of people because everybody's got different motivations. It costs money to set up a node. It, it's just, um, it's hard. I would, I would add to that. So we started in 2016, 15, looking into blockchain because everybody was, was, was enthusiastic about blockchain, all the potential, all the opportunities. And then 2017, the price exploded, so everybody was worried about the, the cryptocurrencies. Now it's going back to the blockchain. But I think the Australian Stock Exchange has a pilot project where they're trying to move to a settlement system that's based on blockchain type technology. I think they call it Chess. So that would be a great uh, first project, I think, to, to see if, if, if this technology is viable. And uh, potentially, there'll, there'll be other opportunities. I think it just points to the fact that we are in a very sort of early stage of this technology being adopted and all the details hashed out. It, it's very difficult to actually make it work. Like implementing implement, it. Implement, yeah. Implementation yeah. is <laughs> difficult. And there is that operational risk that we already talked about to get the cryptography right, to make sure that things are as secure as you expect them to be or as you, as you intended them to be. Yeah, I mean, you heard about it in 2015, you're starting to see it kind of land, right? Exony finally just put something out where they're starting to actually trade stuff through. I think they're doing, they got some form of structured product deal, and I think like State Street's trying it out to start. But like, they're, those things are landing now, right? So you heard the rah-rah, we can like solve this problem, and then they sort of been building it quietly the last couple of years. The thing though about like a lot of those like blockchain implementations for like settlement is like they're actually like centralized systems most of the time. They're not really like sitting on public cryptographic like, 
like networks. Um, like they ended up because it just makes sense for a bunch of trusted FIs to just use a centralized system anyway because they all trust each other. Like it's the agreements they're just like moving around are sort of implicit on that trust anyway. But I, I'll, I'll bet I'll bet 10, 15 years from now we will be settling things using cryptographic techniques and probably some form of distributed ledger technology that's verifiable. In a lot of ways, this is like the internet, right? I mean, there was a lot of hype in 1993, 1994 about you know what you'd be able to do, and it took another 10 or 15 years. So it just it takes a it's a lot harder to do than people think. <clears throat> it just takes time. 